Um, so without further ado, um, I would like to introduce Phil Renforth, who's had quite an arduous journey <coughs> to get here today. So uh, we're very grateful so, um, for turning up, and you're going to be um, presenting to us this evening with experiments. So it's going to be, is it going to be interactive? Are you going to ask for volunteers? Like <laughs> yes. so, have you got your slides up? So can we speed up weathering to help prevent climate change, which very much fits in very nicely with how we're looking at sustainability, and in particular, going forward next year, um, the Geological Society, it's got the year of life. So, thank you very much, Phil. Until I get dragged off the stage, I suppose. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Tracy. Um, maybe I'll start the presentation with a show of hands, please. Uh, how many people in the room are optimistic about us preventing dangerous climate change in the future? Smattering of hands. What about pessimistic? Who's pessimistic about it? Goodness. So for those watching at home, there was, a, I think, a, an overwhelming majority of, of pessimism in the room about us preventing dangerous climate change. So I've been working on um, solutions to, to prevent climate change for, for quite a long time now. And, it's, and as you would expect, I get asked that question quite a lot um, by journalists, by question and answer sessions, um, by students. Um, and I suppose my answer um, usually depended on how I got up out of bed in the morning. It was, it was, I was sort of balancing either way. Um, but I think more recently I've come to, to view that question is, is rather quite strange. It's quite strange, isn't it, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about solving climate change. It's, it's almost like asking someone on an aeroplane whether they're optimistic about it landing. It's, and I suppose depending on who you ask then and what answer you get, you might be a, a little bit more worried or you might feel a little bit better. But I suppose our feelings about where we might end up have nothing to do with the solutions and the feasibility of the solutions that we might impose. So um, I suppose the, 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 the question that we really should be asking is how determined are we or how committed are we to, to solving climate change? And I suppose in recent years, that commitment and that determination has is, is grown. And I think that's probably more important and it certainly gives us hope for the future. Um, and the clicker is... Nowhere to be seen. Oh dear. There's no clicker down here. Oh dear. <coughs> ah, it's like an old school death. Ah, here it is. Yeah. Got it. I'm sure Gary was screaming at me up there saying it's underneath the. The desk, okay, fantastic. Um, so my, um, uh, I suppose um, I should say thanks to the engineering group for inviting me to come and speak today, and, and specifically for Tom Hall for roping me into this. He can't make it tonight, so I hope he's watching from home and he's, he's feeling a lot better. Um, I should say also thanks to um, a lot of the people who've um, uh, contributed to this, this research, um, who are listed below here, and obviously a lot more than that. Um, and, uh, of course, point out that the, the views expressed are my own and my own alone. So the, the, the question I, I pose to you is, can we um, speed up weathering to prevent climate change? And the, the simple answer to that is, is yes. That's all I had to say. Thanks. Uh, any questions? <laughs> so maybe I'll, I'll try and unpack that during the, the next sort of half an hour, 40 minutes or so. Um, the, but at first I'd like to, to start with um, framing this, this, this conversation um, a little bit first. Um, and I'll frame it, well first I'll say that there'll be no consensus to, to solving climate change. There won't be a unified plan ever. Um, and the reason why I think that is essentially if you can answer these two uh, questions. Locate yourself on this grid for me. The first question on the x-axis is how severe do you think the risk is of climate change? How bad do you think climate change will get? And the next question on the y-axis is how difficult will it be to solve climate change? Now, 
where would you locate yourself on that, that, that grid? I suppose I would locate myself in the top, hand, top right hand side. You know, I think climate change is, is, is important, the risks are severe, but also the, um, it's difficult to solve. And I should say that this is from Oliver Morton's book, The Planet Remade. It's a really excellent book, and I encourage you all to read it. Um, but the, the, the point really is, is even if we all locate ourselves in the upper right-hand corner of this, this grid, we won't be in exactly the same point, right? There'll be a spread um, of, of opinion, of, of decision within that. And this scale is relative, so we could even relocate the, the origin of that scale to the center of our grid, and we'd see a distribution of points, right? And, and the, the dis the, what causes that distribution is essentially a whole range of different factors from cultural to how we perceive, uh, individually perceive the environment or personal philosophy, uh, how we perceive technology and the importance of technology, um, politics, um, a whole range of different um, uh, influences which might locate us on this grid. And the point is, is that the, the distribution is essentially what creates this uncertainty about how we might move forward in the future. Um, with climate change. So there's not going to be a single solution or a single vision, and it will vary. And I'll come back to this at the end of my talk about how we might get over this. But I suppose what I'd like to, to dive into, and I know that we've got a lot of, maybe all geoscientists in the room, so I'm, I'm probably going to skim over this, but what is weathering? But if you, if you haven't thought about weathering for a while, then I'll just give you a quick um, introduction. So what is chemical weathering? Well, just very simply, it's the chemical breakdown and sometimes transformation of minerals. Um, and in its simplest form, you have a, a mineral plus water gives you some sort of dissolution product, and those dissolution products sometimes give you new minerals. Um, the minerals I'd be talking about in this, this presentation focus mainly on silicate minerals. Um, uh, and if going back to maybe your fundamental geology, a uh, silicate mineral is essentially a, a, a pyramid um, or tetrahedra of uh, oxygen atoms covalently bonded to a silicon atom in the middle. And those are sometimes um, ionically bonded to a cation. Um, commonly, it's uh, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. Um, and that cation is actually really quite important when we're thinking about um, capturing CO2. Um, I could also talk about the contribution of carbonate weathering. Um, I'm kind of going to skim over that um, and, and not really talk about it too much. Um, but if you want a bit more of an explanation, I can go back to that in, at the end of my talk. Um, but let's just think about silicate weathering. Um, in terms of the mechanism, I think, so the mechanism, there's quite well dis defined mechanisms of silicate dissolution. Um, and this has been researched quite heavily over the last uh, 30, 40 years or more. Um, the, the models that have been created well explain experimental data, um, but they're always evolving. And essentially, the, the fundamentals of it are that you've got some sort of charged species in solution, like the polar parts of water or your hydrogen ion, and those, um, uh, those influence the surface charge of your mineral, which weakens the bonds between um, the silicate and the, um, the cation. So ultimately, what you have coming off is dissolution products of a cation, magnesium in this case, and um, aqueous uh, um, silica, dissolved silica. Yeah. Um, what influences the rate at which um, weathering happens or dissolution happens? Um, well, there's a the whole range of different influences. pH is a really important influence on weathering rate. Um, you can see, so we usually express um, uh, dissolution rate in, on a log scale, um, and you can see that you know a pH of nine will be weathering or dissolving 100 times slower than something at a pH five or six. Um, so pH is massively important. Um, temperature is also important. They often follow Arrhenius um, uh, relationships. The hotter the temperature, the faster the dissolution rate. Um, other charged species in solution, like Lagans, um, organic or otherwise, um, influence the, the rate of weathering. So if you have more charged um, species in solution, they can influence the charge on the surface and ultimately reduce in, in a quicker weathering rate. Um, available surface area, you'll notice that this graph is normalized. The rate is normalized to, to surface area. That's surface area of mineral. 
Um, and essentially, the, the weathering happens on very specific points on that surface area, so it's not evenly distributed. But essentially, the more surface area you have, or the smaller your particles are, the more dissolution you have. And then finally, saturation. So we can only squeeze a certain amount of mineral into solution. And the, 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 the closer we approach that saturation level, the slower our weathering rate gets. So these are sort of intrinsic things that, that affect the, the dissolution rate. And we might want to engineer some of those things when we, we, um, when we, we try to speed up um, weathering. So just to um, add a, a little bit um, of chemical formulae onto this um, uh, basic explanation, these are a um, sort of modified version of the, the classic urea, uh, um, urea equations, not urea, but <laughs> um, the 1950s urea equations. Um, and essentially, it's a reaction of CO2 with a silicate mineral. Um, the first line, the dissolution products are calcium and bicarbonate and aqueous silica. And then those dissolution products could form new minerals. Okay. Um, if we wanted an explanation about carbonate weathering, I've, that, that's sort of one of the reasons why I've separated these out. And we, we can come back to that in the questions if you like. Um, in terms of uh, thermodynamics of this, it's really quite interesting. I mean, as a species, our ecological niche is essentially that. So we go from hydrocarbons, and we oxidize the carbon to form CO2. That's where we, we live as a, as a species. It's what, one of the reasons that causes the problems of, of, of climate change in the first place. And we're, we often think that CO2 is the sort of thermodynamic stable minimum for, for carbon, but it actually isn't. For forming carbonates, by weathering silicates, we might end up somewhere down here. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's one of the few things that we can actually do with carbon dioxide that is exothermic. Um, a lot of the other things, like turning it into fuels again, means that we have to go back up this, this, this thermodynamic gradient. Uh, and uh, all silicate minerals uh, aren't created equally in this context. So different um, minerals will have different reactions with CO2. And this is what this graph shows. So the, the y-axis here is essentially the tons of or CO2 is the tons of CO2 per ton of, of rock. And something like a, an ultra-basic rock, like a dunite, you might be on parity, so one for one, in terms of CO2 per ton of mineral. For basic rocks, you, you might at best be looking at 0.5 or 0.4, um, down to 0.2. So... Um, we might want to selectively well, select the minerals that will give us the, the highest bang for our buck. But that's maybe not always the case, and I'll try and explain why later. Um, and maybe just, um, just rounding off this, this silicate science component, um, we know that so subject of quite heavy um, and ongoing research is the relationship between weathering and CO2 and climate in deep time. Um, the sort of early model in the, uh, 40 years ago was the Blagg model. Um, there's been sort of revisions of that and new models proposed and some really interesting work trying to relate that, those models to um, chemical proxies. So trying to look at chemical proxies for intensity of weathering over time and relating that back to the models. But it's really interesting work that's ongoing. Um, and I'm only going to give it one slide. So sorry if you're really interested in this. Uh, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating work, and I, I recommend you looking into it if, you, if you're interested. Um, in terms of, well, the, the question is, well, if weathering speeds up at increased temperatures, wouldn't climate change influence weathering in the future? Won't we naturally be speeding up weathering um, from climate change, and won't that just solve the problem in it by itself? Well, the, 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 quite, the answer to that is yes, but it will take a really long time. So if we stopped doing... Um, stopped emitting CO2 tomorrow, what would happen is over the sort of one to 10 year time frame, we'd have CO2 dissolving in the oceans. And that's essentially what's happening at the moment. We've got ocean acidification. On the 100 years time scale, we've got CO2 dissolving into the oceans and sort of mixing into the deep ocean. On the 1,000 year time scale, um, we've got CO2 dissolving into the oceans and, um, and circulation in the oceans. But we've also got dissolution of carbonate sediments, which starts to lock up some of that CO2. So a bit of carbonate weathering there in the oceans. And then on the 10,000-year time scale, the 
the difference between sedimentation in the oceans and weathering of carbonate on the land surface means that we start to get an appreciable or significant amount of carbonate weathering on the land. And then eventually on the 100,000 time, uh, yeah, time frame, we get silicate weathering coming into, into the equation. So we can't really wait if we want to do something about climate change. We can't wait for 100,000 years. We need to do something um, a lot more rapid than that. So the question is, can we turn this reaction, uh, can we make force this reaction to happen on this sort of time scale? Okay, so that leads into the next part of my, my talk, which is, can we accelerate um, weathering? Um, I suppose the, the first, the context of this is the, the resource that we have in terms of rocks. So you might be initially thinking, do we even have enough silicate rocks to, to do this? Um, maybe, maybe the geologists aren't thinking that, but um, uh, maybe you already know the answer. But just to, as a terms of context, um, this is carbon in the Earth system. That's what this diagram shows. So all of the carbon in above ground biomass, plants, trees, animals, is this box here that little green box. This is all of the carbon in the atmosphere, in the oceans, uh, soil biomass. And then what's just popped up there is essentially what we've added to the Earth system um, since the Industrial Revolution in terms of fossil fuels. So this is responsible for the, the one degree of, of climate change that we've already experienced. Um, this is what we might put into the Earth system over the next 80 years, 100 years. So these are different emission scenarios going from this, this little one is what avoids climate change. That's our limit. But we might end up putting the big box into the Earth system. Um, so the question is, well, what can silicate minerals do in terms of their capacity for sequestering CO2? Well, the, the capacity, if we, if we mined all of the silicates close to the Earth's surface, um, sort of a 50 meter, let's say an arbitrary 50-meter uh, depth, um, the, the capacity for capturing CO2 would be essentially the area of that circle. So we could capture essentially everything in the Earth's system, like I don't know, hundreds of times over, even thousands of times over. So it, I suppose that we'd never want to do that, obviously. But the, the, the point is, is that we could, only, we could eke out a really small percentage of this, this potential to do quite a significant impact on what our, our future emissions might be. So there's great potential there. Um, we just need to figure out a way to use it. Um, one way that uh, I suppose the, the first idea that was proposed um, was proposed in the, the mid-90s, um, and there's, there's companies that are getting started doing this. But the idea was to stick your silicate rock into a essentially pressure cooker like this. So the, the pressure cooker would work at something like 150 bar C, pure CO2, 180 degrees, um, and you would essentially cook your CO2 with water in that in that, that reactor. Um, and what was essentially the outcome of that was quite affirmative. We can actually speed up the reaction. So um, amazingly, um, uh, we, you know, the, the, the results that were presented were that it, within sort of a matter of hours, we were getting you know, 80, seven, sort of 60 to 90% conversion of the silicate into a carbonate, new carbonate mineral. And that's incredible, isn't it? I mean, think of the reactions that were taking millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years, have now been sped up to happen in hours. The problem is, is that chemical engineers don't work on hours. They work on um, minutes to an hour. So this is just too slow for a chemical engineering process. And the, uh, um, the, the, the capital or the, the, the expense required to create those conditions um, has in the past been viewed as a prohib prohibitively expensive. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about exp um, costs within this, this, this talk, and maybe you can come back to me on the questions and I can explain a little bit more. But at, at the moment, if, you've got, if you start with pure CO2, there's cheaper things you can do with it, like injecting it underground. Um, it's notionally a lot cheaper than reacting it with your silicate. And there's a few other ideas that have been proposed. Um, so instead of just putting everything into one reactor and letting the, the reaction happen in a single step, there's a bunch of multiple step processes that have been proposed. And this is a really interesting one where you, um, you essentially re extract the magnesium from your silicate with an ammonium sulfate um, and then um, uh, create magnesium sulfate and then swing that back using the, the ammonia that's produced. Um, 
uh, I think, say, my, my PhD supervisor, David Manning, described this as sucking the flavor from the sweet. It's sort of it's quite jokingly, I should say, but it's a sort of conceptual way of thinking about this. We're trying to get the magnesium out of the, out of the, the mineral first. Um, the techno-economics of that, that um, type of reaction, and there's a bunch of different uh, proposals, haven't really quite been worked out yet. So this is still ongoing research. Um, but it's quite exciting that the, um, the sort of lab scale stuff seems to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and then you might have come across this, this project before. So this is uh, something called the Cobfix project. Um, it's uh, working on a geothermal power station in, in Iceland. And the idea is that a small proportion of the CO2 that's generated from this, this power station is taken, extracted, and uh, uh, reacted with water. So react with water, and then it's pumped underground into the basalt. And the experimental work that's been done on that, um, using um, some interesting traces, has shown that actually a large proportion, above 95% of the CO2, has been reacted away within, within I think it's on the order of months to, to a year. So, and they, they've re-drilled this, this environment and shown the carbonate in the veins of the, of the, the basalt. So it's, um, again, another project demonstration that's showing that we can actually speed up weathering to happen on a human-relevant timescale. It's not taking millions of years. It's taking on the order of hours to, in this case, months. OK, so that's, that's interesting. I suppose what I'm focused on in terms of my research is how we can use that to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, so um, one sort of proposal to do that is to take your mineral, to crush it up, and to spread it onto agricultural soils. Um, and this, uh, the, the image in the background here is from a field trial doing just that in, the, um, in Illinois. Um, so it's, uh, this is sort of just the, one of the first field trials to, to test this idea. Um, why would we bother to do CO2 from the atmosphere if we've got all of these emissions, right? Why, why don't we just start with CO2 emissions and then think about um, the atmosphere? Well, uh, the reason behind this is that since um, uh, Paris in 2015, the, the governments have agreed to limit global uh, climate change to less than two degrees of warming. What that means is actually our emissions trajectory has to follow something like this. Um, this is the mission trajectory, and we have to go to essentially zero by some time, um, well, depending on who you, you talk to, but it, these modeling results suggest sometime by 2090. Well, net zero, what that means is we can't actually completely decarbonize our economy. There's always going to be some residual emissions left in the system. So the residual we need to account for by sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, and this could be an incredibly large amount. I mean, it's, it's about half of what our current emissions are. This is what the, the green um, shaded area shows, that our negative emissions, they're called negative emissions, sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, has to scale up to something on the orders of tens of gigatons of year, uh, per year by the end of the century. This is an absolutely enormous challenge. And what the reason I'm interested in, in this is because we don't really quite know how to do this at scale yet. So weathering on the land surface might be one of the ways to do this. Um, and the question you might ask is, well, if we can't, um, you know, we can make the, um, the reactions work at uh, elevated temperature and pressure, do we have any hope of making them work at ambient conditions? And uh, I suppose this is um, a slightly hand-wavy way of, of, of doing this, but uh, some modeling work I did, whereas if you think of the high temperature and pressure systems, they work on the order of hours. So I should explain this graph. Um, on the x-axis we have weathering rate, and this is a log scale, so this is a log, log, log scale graph. Um, and we've got slow weathering rates down here and fast weathering rates down here. Um, the y-axis is essentially how long are we prepared to wait for this reaction to reach 90%, so one hour all the way up to 10 years. And the, the, the color scale is essentially the initial particle size we need to crush our particles to to get them to react in that time. So the, dark, the, the blue is a millimeter-sized particle, and the deep red goes all the way down to one millimeter. And this model kind of breaks down after one, uh, sorry, one micron 
size particles, and it breaks down after that, so it doesn't, it's not really that applicable in this range. But anyway, the, the high temperature and high pressure system reactors work around here. So this is the, the, the reactions we've shown to work in the order of a couple of hours. They, they, they operate on this sort of area. And if we drop to ambient temperatures, we might lose four orders of magnitude in terms of rate. But we might also gain four, four orders or five orders of magnitude in terms of time because we don't need the reactions to happen on the order of hours anymore. We can, if we're spreading minerals onto the land surface, we, the, our time is essentially the, the, maybe akin to um, agricultural cycles, sort of on the order of, of, of cropping cycles. And that's years. So, and, and you can see that actually the, the particle requirements in terms of crushing are equivalent. So that gives us at least a little bit of hope that the reactions might work on the time frames that we're, we're interested in. Okay, um, in terms of the, the supply chain um, to, to get this to, uh, to work, you need to extract your rock, grind it to a suitable particle size, transport it, and then spread it onto an agricultural field. And you're thinking, probably at this moment, how on earth can this be carbon negative, right? What, all of these activities must release more CO2 than they, they draw down. Um, and I suppose that's the question that um, I, came, uh, I arrived at when I first started thinking about this. And the answer to that is simply, we can make this process carbon negative. Um, and it's ultimately down to what's happening here. So this is predominates about 80% of the energy requirements are from grinding. The rest, particularly um, excavation and spreading, don't really come into it as much. Um, I always thought transport would be quite limiting. And we, we, had, we did this sort of thought experiment where, um, and this is just a thought experiment, um, but if you take the Samuel Ophiolite, which is a, an olivine-rich deposit in Oman, uh, you extract it and you crushed the rock we wanted to ask, well, how far could we trans transport that before we, um, before we ran out of carbon budget, you know, before we started releasing more CO2 than we, we drew down? And essentially, this, the answer's on this graph. So the, dark color, the, the, the red colors are essentially as far as we can go before we blow our carbon budget. So we can t notionally take a rock from uh, Oman and transport it all the way into the Canadian prairies before we blow our, our carbon budget. And actually, the main conclusion from this, and it's been confirmed is actually the distribution of, of silicate rocks is so widespread that we don't need to, we don't need to go from Oman to, to the Canadian prairies. That was just a thought experiment. We can act, most of the, the, the rock we need is within transportable distance of the application areas. Um, so this is a, some of the costs that have been proposed for this idea. And the, you can see that the costs are enormously uh, variable really uncertain. And the uncertainty is really around the rates of dissolution within soils. So we don't really quite know how quickly these minerals will dissolve when we add them to the land surface. Um, and this is a sort of a, a sensitivity analysis of costs. And you can see that it's actually dominated by electricity cost. And if we run our electricity system off natural gas and coal, there's absolutely no chance that this, this is going to be carbon negative. But if we run it off, let's say, renewable energy, and our grid is um, progressing more and more to renewables, then this, is, this becomes more and more feasible. So there's an interesting playoff between where we get our energy from and the feasibility of these, these technologies. But the, I should say that you know, from my early work to sort of more recent stuff that's just about to be published, we're coming down with that uncertainty as we know more and more about these technologies. Um, this is a really interesting graph. Um, just like to spend a couple of seconds introducing it. Um, essentially, this is relating combination energy, crushing energy, grinding energy, to the surface area that we create. So as we put more energy into crushing, we create higher and higher surface area. Smaller particles is more surface area. And the, the blue crosses on here are essentially real lab data between the energy and the surface area that's created. And the, these bars here represent the efficiency of that process. So for some low surface area crushing technologies, we're actually quite efficient. As we go more and more um, intensive and higher surface area, we come, become really, really poorly efficient in terms of crushing, to the point where we're less than 1% efficient in terms of um, combination between, of crushing. And there's a real opportunity here 
for technology improvement into that space there. So if we can, if we can prove crushing technologies from where they are now, and that's what I based my, my assessment on previously, but if we can go from there to here, um, the comminution energy, the crushing energy from these, these ideas will almost disappear. Now that technology leap is essentially the same leap that Watt made with the steam engine, going from the Commons atmospheric engine to the steam engine. That's sort of what we're looking at here in terms of technology improvement. Okay, um, I'll just flag up the, the, this, this experiment again. It's run by the Lady Hume Center for Climate Change uh, Mitigation, led out of the University of Sheffield. They're spreading um, powdered basalt onto a, a, um, a field of both corn and soy in, um, in Miscanthus in Illinois. And I think they're in their second growing season now, so it's um, still early, early days experiments with that. Um, but some of the uh, modeling results, uh, modeling work that's based on that is really quite interesting about how much land area do we use um, and how much CO2 might we draw down. And th this is sort of fractional areas of different croplands for three countries. So, you know, going from 10% all the way up to using all of the cropping area and how much CO2 might we draw down. And the sort of the, the take-home mes take message of that research is that we can do quite a lot, actually, in terms of... Um, uh, CO2 removal on the sort of gigaton scale for you know these big countries using you know a sizable portion of the the cropping area and if you look at other ideas for removing CO2 from the atmosphere like bioenergy CCS uh, growing biomass creating CO2 and pumping it underground you know the, the sort of global um, extent of that might be sort of on the order of gigatons per year um, the sort of range of ranges of est estimates, but um, I suppose that's one one assessment. So it's at least competitive with other ideas um, uh, that that have been proposed. Okay. So one area that I'm really interested in, and I've done a lot of work in the past, is looking at well, you know, we can use natural minerals potentially for this. Can we use faster reacting minerals? Um, and faster reacting minerals are produced from industrial processes. Um, so things like iron, the iron and steel industry produce a, a material called slag, which is a, a fast reacting, well, it's a range of different minerals, but it's uh, rich in silicate, fast reacting silicates and glasses. Uh, mine wastes, potentially. Um, red mud, maybe. And then, so these are all byproducts or wastes of, of an industry. But then the products of, of industries might also be used as well. And there's a massive opportunity for the cement industry. So I wanted to um, <coughs> give you a demonstration of this uh, using my, uh, uh, my bottle here. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about this because I, I, you know, I was quite late getting here and I've not tested this new material yet. So this is cement. Um, so I'm using cement, one of the fast reacting silicates. The problem is, is that if you have too much free lime in your cement, the reaction is so exothermic and melts the plastic, which has happened to me once before, and at the end, the bottle ends up exploding. So um, we'll give it a go and see, see how we get on. Um, look, John's uh, looking a bit shifty there. Um, okay. We're going to be all right. So I've just added a bit of water to the um, to the bottle. And it's a new uh, a new uh, bike. So I'm, I'm I'm using CO2, which you fill your bike tires up with. Oh, that's... Okay. So I think we're going to be all right in terms of the. So I'm just going to put some CO2 in this bottle, and it's got it's, all it's got is cement and water in. Um, try not to freeze my hand as well while I do it. Hmm. Maybe I'll just put it down. 
Uh, I'll hold it up for the camera. Uh, yeah, that's looking all right. So, So it takes a little while to, to react. Um, I'll, uh, I'll come back to this. Maybe I'll just leave it here for, for now. Um, okay, so it's not exploded or melted the plastic, which is great news. Um, okay, so in terms of um, uh, these, these alkaline materials, well, they're pretty much in any location where they're found that you find carbonate. Um, so I've looked in a whole range of different environments where these materials are located, and you almost always find carbonate. Um, for instance, this is a, a former lime kiln, um, where this is actually the lime kiln, and you can see at the back that we've got these, these carbonate um, formations in the, even in the kiln, but actually on the outwash. So the kiln would dump um, piles of lime, and then the drainage sort of channels of where this, this line was draining to, we found these, these sort of amazing tufas forming. And this is in um, Black Mountain um, in, in Wales. Um, in demolition soils, so uh, this is work that um, we've done in the past. Uh, Carla, who's in the audience, has, has worked on this as well. Um, and essentially, demolition, um, common practice in demolition is to mix some of the demolition waste into the soil. Um, following, um, uh, most of the demolition waste is, is crushed and recycled, but some of it ends up in the soil. Um, and we find that actually we get quite a large amount of carbonate in urban soils. And that's a very <laughs> typical thing to find in an urban soil. And the carbonate has come from essentially the same reaction that's hopefully going to go on here. <laughs> okay. Um, we find carbonates on the underside of old concrete structures as well. I mean, you, you'll start to see this all over the place when you, when you leave, um, uh, leave the, the presentation tonight. You'll, you'll be looking for carbonates. Um, but pretty ubiquitous on old concrete structures. We find them in slag heaps as well. So um, uh, this is uh, in Scunthorpe. And the water in this, this um, landfill facility is, is sort of popping out turquoise. And the reason why is because sort of at the bottom of that water is a sort of nice layer of carbonate that's giving it a sort of nice shine. Um, and we find it in mine tailings as well. So this is sort of a veneer of carbonate forming on old mine tailings from a, um, I think this is a chrysotile mine in, in, um, in Canada. Um, we find sort of magnesium carbonate forming on the, on, on the surface of those tailings. So it's pretty ubiquitous that we find carbonate. Um, in terms of the, the sort of conclusions of that research, um, the, we get meaningful fluxes of CO2, and we can show from the carbon and oxygen isotopes that that CO2 has come from the atmosphere. So we're, we're pretty sure that where the carbons come from. Um, we don't really know the conversion extent. I mean, one of these, the sites we looked at, we get quite a lot of con conversion accidentally over quite a short period of time. But we, we really don't know that across all of the sites. So. I think I'm running out of time, actually, so I'm just going to kind of skip over some of this. But in terms of the, the amount of carbon that could be drawn down by these as well, quite a lot. So um, this is a recent modeling study. Ah, there it is. And we could be talking about something like on the order of two, uh, three to seven gigatons of CO2 per year. Now, thinking about the, the original requirement, that's up to 20. So just using these waste materials, we might be able to do a significant amount of that. That CO2 removal. Okay, um, I'm probably running out of time, so I'm going to have to skip over um, a project we've got on slag at the moment, looking at um, slag carbonation. Um, but we're really starting to look at field trials now about how we can accelerate carbonation and CO2 uptake in, in slag from the iron and steel industry. So it's a really kind of exciting project. I'm just going to have to skip over it. It's the slag heap we're, we're working on. Uh, I know you guys really like drilling. Uh, I like drilling as well, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to skip over that. Um, so we, it's ongoing um, research. And I think what I'd like to um, maybe two things I'd like to, to finish on. The first is what the role of the geoscientist is within this, 
um, this space. And I suppose geoscience is, is always, and pretty much any profession is, is always um, measured itself against the problems it's trying to solve. And us in the geosciences are, are no different. I mean, you think, um, where would engineering geology be without the sort of large infrastructure projects of the, the early 20th century, and particularly the dam failures, right? I mean, um, if you look at some of the, the early engineering geology textbooks, they were, they were wrote really for this, this problem. And the same goes for um, petroleum geosciences. You know, that, that was as a profession created to, to answer questions about our energy supply and our energy needs. Um, and you know, where would resource um, engineer, uh, geologists be without pot noodle, right? Um, and the pot noodle mines of Wales. Uh, maybe you didn't see that advert in there. <laughs> Apparently that's where pot noodle comes from. Anyway, uh, or other materials. Um, you know, the, the resource geology is really, really about um, extracting the, the, the material needs that we, we need. And probably more recently is environmental uh, or geo-environmental engineering about solving the problems that were created maybe from the first three there. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's a discipline that's really geared to, to solving a problem. And I suppose the question really is, you know, how as we as a profession are stepping up to the challenge of climate change, um, I think we've been instrumental in um, arguing for why climate change is a problem, and particularly the earth science community um, and the earth systems modeling community have, have been essential in that. But in terms of the solutions, how do we, how do we um, move forward in this space? And there's already people interested in geothermal energy, and there's people interested in CO2 capture underground. But I think this weathering idea opens up a whole new space for, for our, um, uh, our, our community to get involved. And I think... Um, so I, I should confess I'm a, a civil engineer by training, um, and sort of one of the, the sort of biggest learning curves, or one of the, um, the, the richest things I've found about getting interested in, in the geosciences is the scale at which geoscientists think on. Um, and I think if we're going to solve some of the problems of uh, the next century, we really need to be thinking on that sort of scale, on the global scale. And um, we can do that, right? Um, and I think the, the final thing I'd like to, to leave you with is um, essentially going back to my original um, uh, slide. And you know, how, do we, um, how do we move forward when there's such a different um, of opinion of how we actually might solve climate change? And there's a really nice paper in our, our journal. We've just started a new journal called Negative Emission Technologies. And this paper by Julio Friedman is really interesting. And he borrows from this, this book called The Wizard and the Prophet. Um, by Charles Mann. It's a really interesting read. Um, and essentially what uh, Mann was arguing was that there's two broad approaches to solving environmental problems. There's what he defines as the wizard, which is essentially um, technologists, so people who like to use technology to solve environmental problems. And then there's, there's the prophet, someone who thinks that we should be solving environmental problems through be behavioral, behavioral change. So we should be changing our behaviors to uh, to do that. Um, and my fear um, about um, moving forward and trying to prevent climate change is not that we can't innovate fast enough or we, can, we can't create technology fast enough or that we can't change our behaviors fast enough. It's that there, there will be a conflict between these two approaches. So there's already a tension um, uh, between whether we should change behavior or whether we should use technology. And I'm, I'm worried that the, that tension will actually turn into a conflict. Um, and it's something that we need to recognize and manage. And I suppose uh, Julio um, had it right with that last word in his, uh, in his title there, is that we should maybe approach this with humility and recognize that there's two sides to this. So, you know, if you're envisaging a complete change of our capitalist way of doing, uh, of managing the economy, then you're probably going to be disappointed in the future. Equally, if you're a technologist, you're probably still going to need to change large chunks of your lifestyle over the next 50 years. So there's, there's definitely a middle ground that we need to find and we need to own and recognize. And I suppose that's all I had to say. I'll need to check up on my, my bottle. And you can see that actually what's happening um, 
is the CO2 is being absorbed into the solution and reacting with the CO2 to um, probably form some carbonates and also bicarbonate. So we've I've sort of demonstrated that this is a reaction that doesn't happen on millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years, but actually has happened in the, the last 10 minutes or so. So, um, and it's actually quite warm in the bottom there as well. So, uh, yeah, I'll take any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thank you for um, not being thrown by your uh, your tortuous journey. <laughs> um, so I'll throw up the floor. Has anybody got any questions? Got some roving mics. Um, if you could um, state your name and your affiliation um, for oh, answering the yeah, question, please. and uh, wait for the mics, please, because we th this is being live streamed. Um, so we need to give the people at home a fighting chance of hearing the question. Okay, uh, Matthew Free from Arab. Um, oh, hi. Um, thanks very much for that. It's very, very interesting. Um, you alluded to the costs of, of doing this, and I'm wondering if there is any offsetting of costs by some benefits. And could, could you um, give us some you know, advice on whether it would increase the fertility of the, the soil for the increase the productivity of the crops, you know, all those types of things that would be benefits. So mm. farmers would want to do it worldwide. True. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I, I suppose one, one reason why I've kind of skipped over the costs is um, the a little bit arbitrary and that the costs um, we uh, the costs are really what we're prepared to pay rather than what the technology actually costs. But um, it, just to answer your question, the, in terms of adding um, basalt to agricultural fields, some of the well, some of the early experiments are showing an increase in yield. Um, especially if you choose basalts that are rich in um, potassium and phosphorus. Um, so uh, the experiments are showing uh, something like a 10% increase in, in yield. Um, there's also potential, um, because of uptake of silicon, that you get re um, improved resistance to pests. Um, you potentially improve uh, or replace material that was lost from soil erosion, which is um, a positive of that. Um, I'm probably forgetting one of the other benefits that have been proposed, but there are other benefits. And I'm not quite sure if the economics would work in a way where you can just pay for that technology with the, those benefits. But if you, you had some sort of cost or value for doing the CO2, you might also get quite a lot of benefit from, from doing the, um, the, the, the agricultural benefit as well. Thank you. Uh, Keith Gabriel, certainly a fascinating subject. Two questions. First one leading on from that. If we're taking mafic minerals and spreading them on fields, are you actually going to alter the microbiology of the field if you're getting a, a lot of effectively rust forming? And the second one, you mentioned in injecting underground notionally cheaper. I went to a presentation a few years ago where they were looking at um, Hatfield Colliery trying to make that carbon neutral. And... <coughs> they'd realized that the cost of the pipeline, it was going to be injected into the North Sea, but the cost of the pipeline was 1.5 billion before you'd injected anything. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah so any question. comments would be great. Yeah, so, the, um, so in terms of the changing of the biogeochemistry of the soil once you add a silicate rock to it, the, the, there's a still an open question to, to that. Um, the, like I said, the experiments are really quite early in their stage. Um, so I don't think there's an answer um, for you at the moment. Um, in terms of, well, in terms of costs to um, sequester CO2 underground, uh, I suppose the, the work that's been doing, um, and this is injecting into, into saline aquifers, the work that's been done so far, and I'm thinking of the Slepner project in the North Sea, the costs there are somewhere around $12 per tonne, and that's including shipping and compression, so transport and compression of the CO2. In terms of the mineral carbonation, um, reacting CO2 with, uh, at high temperature and high pressure, the costs there are anywhere from $50 per tonne all the way up to several hundred dollars per tonne. So if that's for completely just for a like-for-like -like, um, comparison, Maybe doesn't it doesn't stack up, but 
that ongoing research as well because there's potential cost recovery, there's metal recovery from that process that you might be able to, to do. Um, and then there's also liability differences where the CO2 you react with a, um, with a rock essentially stays as a carbonate rock for forever. And the CO2 that you pump in the ground may, has some potential in terms of liability for leakage. So there might be an important dif distinction there, but I don't think that's really been that well worked out. Thank you. I'm uh, Ivan Hodgson. Thank you. Very uh, interesting presentation. I hope some of us at least go home being a little bit more optimistic. Um, I was just wondering, you specifically talking about agricultural land. Does it have to be agricultural land? Will it work on desert and semi-desert? And, and, and what about climate, weather? Does it have to be, uh, you know, will it work in arid and, and wet areas and so forth? Yeah, it probably wouldn't work on a, in a desert or an arid area because you need, it's an aqueous reaction, so you need water to make this, this work. Um, there's, a, there's a few ideas about um, adding this to coastal environments as a sort of replacement for beach nourishment. So we add something like a gigaton of, of sand to our, beach, to our coastlines every year across the world. Could that be, instead of quartz, could that be another, a, a more reactive mineral that, you know, as it washes out and could, it dissolves in the, in the ocean, could it be then, you know, react with CO2 as part of that process? Um, that is at the stage of theoretical back-of-the-envelope calculation, and there's a few um, experiments in the Netherlands to, to look at that in a lab sort of setting. But that's sort of one idea that's out there. Yeah. I assume the, the weathering of carbonate rocks, which probably forms carbon dioxide, is, is minimal. I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked that. Um, no, so, uh, gosh, I'm going to have to go all the way back, but um, maybe I should have put that at the end. Uh, if, you, if you weather um, carbonate rocks with a stronger uh, base, so I'm thinking something like a hydrochloric acid or a sulfuric acid, then you release CO2, and that's the classic experiment you, you do as a student where you, you, know, you put your, your carbonate rock with vinegar and you see it, you watch it fizz. It's a classic geological test for carbonate, right? If you do that with carbonic acid, you don't. You get a drawdown of CO2. Because um, what the reaction is, is you get essentially one divalent cation, like calcium, and two bicarbonate ions. One of those bicarbonate has come from your carbonate rock, and the other bicarbonate has come from CO2 in the, let's say, in the atmosphere, in the gas. I'm Jane Kelsey from Atkins. Just wondering again about the agricultural um, aspect of it. Would it be more efficient to use the... Um, I guess the dust in sort of paddy fields and an already aqueous environment or a lake or something. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting idea. Um, I don't... Th I, that potentially might work um, or speed up weathering because you have a lot of silicon uptake in, in, in rice crops. Um, so that could enhance the, the weathering rate. Um, the problem in some ways is that you potentially saturate your solution um, with your mineral, um, your dissolving mineral. So you, the idea with an agri, uh, sort of not, uh, like an arable agricultural field is that you, you have a, a flux of solution through that system, which would then take this dissolution products away from the reaction side. If, you, if you're not pushing that solution through the system in a static water environment, you might end up saturating your solution. So. Mm -hmm. I suppose no one's really thought about it in detail, so it's an open question, I would say. It's a good question, though. Uh, John Perry, Independent. Thank you, Phil. That was uh, very thought-provoking. Um, I've got a couple of questions. One is, um, the big problem seems to me, from what you've said, is where you actually store the ground silica and uh, one idea is to spread it onto fields um, but I think there might be other applications during construction um, on infrastructure in, in particular which I think is worth thinking about. My second point was um, from the sort of lime stabilization point of view 
Um, it's quite common for farmers to spread calcium carbonate onto their fields to raise the pH. Yeah. By putting ground basalt, aren't you doing the opposite and making it more acidic? And therefore, that will have a detrimental effect. Uh, okay, I'll, a good question. So I'll answer your, your second one first. Um, so now you, you're, you're essentially doing the same thing. You, you, if you dissolve a basalt in an agricultural field, you're making it more basic. Um, so it could be an alternative to agricultural liming. Um, so, I mean, we add globally, we add something on the order of a couple of million tonnes of, of calcium carbonate to agricultural fields to do just that. Um, we might be able to double the... The, there's, a, there's potentially an unknown CO2 drawdown from that, so it's not really well understand what the carbon dynamics are of that in the soil. Um, but we could make improve that by adding basalt instead of lime. But we'll, if to do to make a meaningful impact on CO2 um, emissions on climate, we need to do probably an order of magnitude more than more than what we do in terms of agricultural liming, something on the gigaton scale rather than the hundreds of megaton scale. Um, first question about potential use of materials in um, construction. I suppose that, that's one of the ideas we've got with the waste materials sort of slag, is that you could carbonate that material and then use it as a, as a potentially as an aggregate in construction. Um, the, the problem is, is aggregates are really low value. So kind of powering this, this technology with the, the value of aggregates probably isn't going to work. But it could be a, a sort of secondary benefit that we might we might, might want to exploit. And I should say that there is a company working in the UK at the moment that takes CO2, flue gas, um, waste materials, and they form essentially carbon um, uh, construction blocks from it. Um, the company called Carbonate. Um, I recommend you look it up if you're, you're interested. But um, they claim to be making uh, low carbon or even carbon negative construction materials. So. Thank you. Stephen Jeffries, Environmental Geotechnics. Um, would there be any benefit, or maybe it happens naturally anyway, in ploughing the material into the ground? Because the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in soils is normally significantly greater than in the atmosphere. Yeah. It's an ongoing question, that. Um, so, the, the, the CO, so you're, you're right, I mean, the CO2, the CO2 in soils can go, get up to, what, 10%? The CO2 in you know? is 10 times the atmosphere. Yeah. Sort of yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it can be really quite high, but where that is in the, in the profile is actually um, not potentially uh, the same as the, cr um, the plowing depth. So Too deep. Yeah, it might be too, you, know, you might be plowing. So it might sort of, there's, there's some other agricultural practices like conservation tillage on, on no-till, where you don't actually till the soil. And if you combine this with, with that, that might actually be quite, quite interesting. But we're still in show actually what the depth we should be mixing to is. Second comment of three, if I may. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out the deserts. Uh, there's a trick they use in deserts for collecting water of putting a plastic sheet slightly dipped and collecting the drips in there. Sure. They're quite damp at night, as happened on the Great Man-Made River, sure. as the chlorides moved into the concrete. So you might be surprised how much reaction there is. Yeah. But, uh, finally, most of the carbon dioxide drawdown on the very large time scale will be biotic rather than abiotic. It'll be quite a lot of it will be um, driven by microbiology or by higher life forms, if you like. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is the work going on on, if you like, biologically driven reactions or microbiologically catalyzed? Because once you've got the bugs going, they may catalyze some of those reactions. Um, and yeah. I was surprised to read that the whole issue in Elements, the IAGC one. There's there's nothing on biocatalysis right. of this. Yeah, there, there is there is silence there. No, there, there is work going on on. Uh, across the whole range of different ideas that are presented, um, sort of biological mediation of, of it. Um, so, you know, the obvious one is the, the, the silicates into agricultural fields and looking at the, 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 the I mean, that, that intrinsically has biology um, working to speed up. Um, but the, the, in the engineered environments like the mine tailings, there's also um, biogeochemists looking at how that, the, the biology might be able to enhance the, 
the, the carbonation rate. Um, it, it just maybe a, a sort of general point to this is that you, you can, a lot of the experimental work suggests you might at the best get a, 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 an order of magnitude increase in weathering rate from biology. Now, if, if you look at my, um, the, the, the graph I presented looking at weathering rate with pH, there's sort of two to three orders of magnitude difference there. So in some ways, we, the, the biology might help, but I think a lot of other factors might also be important within that. You might be able to spread them over wider areas. As well. That's right, yeah. Did you have another one? Or was that the third? No, that was it. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you, Phil. Um, Peter Christensen from Atkins. I was just wondering, um, compared to, because plants draw CO2 out of the atmosphere, and when spreading the silicates that crush, how, how much CO2 does it draw out of the atmosphere compared to the plants growing? I mean, it would depend on the growth stage of the plants, what type of plant, I'm sure, but just to give a bit of a scale or mm. comparison. It's a good question. Uh, running the numbers um, in my head as we speak. Uh, so, in, the, the, in terms of plant drawdown, um, the best you can uh, sort of the, the best you might get from, let's say, a bioenergy system is something on the order of one to ten tons per hectare. Um, now we, we don't quite know what the the application rate or the optimum application rate is, but some of the modelling work that I presented, they were looking at something on the order of maybe 40 tons of rock per hectare. And then in terms of CO2 per tonne of rock, you might be looking at sort of 25%, 20%, 30 30%, so in terms of mass ratio. So you might be looking at something similar to the best biomass um, CO2 drawdown on the order of maybe a tens of tons of CO2 per, per hectare. Yeah, that's more than I expected. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. No more questions. I think we'll um, start to, to draw this this evening to a close. Thank you um, to those in the audience for some very um, interesting questions. Um, I hope you'll, uh, uh, those of you here and those of you um, online at home, will, will join us for the gloss up um, on the 13th of November. And um, uh, I hope you'll join me in thanking Phil in the traditional way.